Good morning, everybody. Hey, folks, how you doing? Dave McRae here. What's shaking? What's going on? It is Tuesday morning, July the 21st, 2020. It's 11.04 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I am coming to you live from the Voice Man Studios in Toronto, Canada. And it is, uh, listen, I know Canada has that uh, stereotype of being, you know, cold all the time. Well, we're actually a four-seasoned country. We get, we get very cold winters, but very hot and humid summers, depending on where you are in the country. And here in Toronto, in Southern Ontario, it is hot. And man, and has it been hot the last number of, uh, I don't know, the last number of, well, I guess probably about 12, 12 to 14 days. The last couple of weeks has been really hot. I'm not talking about hot. I'm talking about like Phoenix, Arizona hot. Right now in Phoenix, I think it's like 105 degrees or something like that. It was 103 here the other day. Uh, so we are definitely, I think it's a bit cooler today. Let me just check here on my phone. What is the temperature today? Uh, of course, here in Canada, we go by Celsius. Uh, so I have to make that conversion, but let me just see here. I think it's a bit cooler today. Yes, it is. Actually, it's a lot cooler today. It, uh, it's only 23 degrees Celsius today, which is very much cooler than it's been. But the last number of, uh, it's going up to 28 today, which is pretty good. But, uh, the other day yet, not yesterday, but the day before it was, uh, with the humid X, it felt like 41 degrees Celsius, which is like 105 Fahrenheit. It was just insane. And it was like that for like six days straight. We were in like this really big heat wave. And I went out for a run the other day and I'm like, <laughs> it was just insane. It was just insane. And that's what I was doing. I was <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, King Kong. Oh, that kid. Hey, he's not king. He's not King Kong versus Go Godzilla versus Kong, I believe, is the actual name of the movie. Of course, that was supposed to be out this year. It was delayed to next year. Uh, I am excited to see this movie. Uh, and we got our first. I mean, everybody's losing their minds, but I mean, it, it, you know, when I saw the other day that they had released an image of uh, um, Kong and Godzilla, Godzilla and Kong, I thought it was an image from the movie. Now, is it an image from the movie? Well, I mean, it could be. It's artwork from the back of, what was it again? I'll read the thing here in a second. The back of uh, toys or something or artwork. Anyways, it, it's not a an, an image from the movie. And that's what I thought it was. I thought it was an image from the movie. At first, I thought maybe it was some cool poster or something like that. But I don't believe that is it. So uh, I looked at it and I thought, well, this is like looking at the back of a box of a Star Wars toy and seeing some sort of artistic, you know, interpretation of Kylo Ren facing Rey. I mean, it just, it could look like that. It could look nothing like that. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I reserve all judgment until I can see the movie, but nonetheless, it's pretty cool to see. Let's move over and see what, uh, what exactly I am talking about here. And uh, I, of course, this comes from yeah, what what is this from again? This is uh, what is this here? This is doo, 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 cinema blend, cinema blend, cinema blend. So this is the other day because it's twenty first day. This is yesterday actually. Godzilla versus Kong concept art finally shows the Titans colliding. It's concept art. Well, I wouldn't. You know, we got Josh McGrath here in the chat room saying it's from to it's on the back of a toys or something. I, I think that might be right. I wouldn't call, li listen, it may, it may be a matter of semantics, but uh, Jason, I wouldn't necessarily call this concept art unless it has been officially released as concept art. Uh, concept art is something that's very different than what would necessarily appear on the back of of, uh, of uh, a set of toys or the box to toys. You know, when I think of concept art, I think of actual concept art that is drawn specifically you know for the movie like it's a it's a it's a scene they have a scene that's laid out and they need some concept art that's drawn they need some storyboards that are drawn maybe before they move into pre-production they have an artist who is drawing up concepts and things like that's what i think of when you know when somebody says concept art actual concept art not necessarily an artistic and you know an artist's interpretation of a cool little scene between these creatures on the back of a box of toys, uh, which isn't necessarily the same thing. But nonetheless, this could be, just be a matter of semantics here. Let's scroll down. Since the release of 2014's Godzilla and 2017's Kong Skull Island, fans of the two widely... 
widely popular titans, have waited in anticipation to see their favorite overpowered monsters collide in the upcoming Godzilla vs. Kong. Uh, Godzilla vs. Kong movie, excuse me. While they, might have, while they might have to wait a bit longer for the movie, they can now get a taste of what things might look like in this concept art of the titans going toe to toe. Again, I don't know if I was writing this article if I would use the, the words concept art. Um, it's just not something I would use. But anyway, uh, a MonsterVerse fan recently shared a piece of concept art. Okay, I guess maybe maybe it is. Is it actual concept art? Maybe it is. Of Godzilla and King Kong about to fight each other on the top of an aircraft carrier. It's about as epic as you might expect. And then some. Check it out. Maybe this actually does happen in the movie. Who knows? This comes from Feel and Film Podcast. And it's pretty darn cool. Now, there are a lot of people that have said, um, you know, why is is why has Godzilla shrunk? Because King Kong is not as big as Godzilla. Well, in, in actuality, I think what's happened here is King, King Kong has grown to become the size or relatively, you know, close to the size of Godzilla. Because if you remember in Kong Skull Island, they said that uh, Kong was still young and uh, he hadn't finished growing yet. And Kong Skull Island, I believe, takes place in the 70s, right? So, and this movie, Godzilla versus Kong, I believe takes place for all intents and purposes in present day. Uh, so that's like 40 years he's had a chance to grow. So no, I don't believe Godzilla has shrunk. I think it's just King Kong or Kong, uh, we'll get to that in a second, has grown to become the size of Godzilla. And they needed to do that because Godzilla would have beaten the ever-loving shit out of King Kong in reality. And, and I still find this matchup sort of... I'm very curious to see what Adam Wingard uh, is going to do. Uh, in t I think that's, yeah, he, he's directing it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm very curious to see what he's going to do with this and how he's going to create a sense of believability with this. Because let's not forget that Godzilla's got atomic breath. He's got nuclear fire coming out of his, you know, I mean, it, you know, end of the, you know, end of discussion, right? Um, so I'm very curious to see movie and you can tend to throw believability out the window but but I am still very curious to see how they handle that and and what that is going to be like so um I'm excited about this uh you know I am a gigantic Godzilla fan it's not that I don't like uh King Kong I do who doesn't like King Kong I grew up with you know I mean I wasn't born yet but the 70 was it 76 King Kong with uh Jessica Lang there um you know I mean that was a great movie a lot of fun to watch uh of course King Kong lives uh, I think with Linda Hamilton, if I'm not mistaken. I think she was in that, 1986, I think. Um, you know, I mean, and I grew up on all the old, the, the 1933 King Kong, and of course, King Kong versus Godzilla from the early 60s. And I mean, I like King Kong, I do. Who doesn't like King Kong? But I've always been a Godzilla guy, always. I've been a gigantic Godzilla fan from ever since I was little. And my favorite movie going Godzilla experience was when my dad took me to see the American version of the sequel to the original Godzilla film. The original Godzilla film, of course, is Godzilla uh, from um, uh, 1954, the Toho produced version. And then, of course, there was the 1956 Americanized version with Raymond Burr uh, playing Steve Martin. Not that Steve Martin, obviously, uh, but playing a character by the name of Steve Martin. And um, it was essentially the 1954 Toho version, but a lot of the um, uh, nuclear so or, or the the uh, political themes uh, and innuendos and subliminal messaging and a bit on the nose kind of stuff was tamed, was was removed because we must not forget that the that the 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 purpose of godzilla his inception was really sort of a metaphor to you know what can happen when you you know, play around with nuclear weapons. And of course it was sort of, you know, it was a shot at the Americans, you know, that essentially this is what you created by dropping those bombs on us in World War II. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, it's a Cliff Notes version, but there was a lot of that subtext and a lot of it wasn't, a lot of it wasn't necessarily sub either. Um, so it was definitely a big part of the original Godzilla film from 1954. Most of that was subdued and kind of, you know, reworked for an American, American audience, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, and then, of course, you have the uh, 
Steve Martin angle to that. Well, in 1984, they released a sequel to the original uh, 1954 version. Uh, and I believe it was called Godzilla 1984 or something like that. And then, of course, the Americans, you know, Hollywood uh, made their American version of that uh, and called it Godzilla 1985. And it had Raymond Burr in it. And I, my dad took me to see that in the movie theater. And I loved it. I loved it. And and to this day, I still think, to this day, I still think Godzilla 1985 has the best suit Godzilla. Now, mind you, there, there, there were some pretty impressive Godzillas later on, Godzilla Final Wars and things like that. I mean, there have been some pretty impressive uh, men in Godzilla suits later on as well. But there's just something about the Godzilla 1985 movie, which is essentially a, a Japanese film with American, you know, shit thrown in. Um, I, to, to this day, there is just that the the animatronic of the mouth and when it would open and the, the combination of the suit and the, it just looks so great. And now, I mean, maybe it's because it's my nostalgia kicking in and, and uh, but it lo looks really, really cool. So I love that movie. I've always been a big Godzilla fan. I have VHS tapes of old Godzilla, you know, Japanese films from the 60s and the 70s that I would tape that would come on TV in the 80s and now they look like shit because of the tracking lines and stuff. And I love it. So I am, I am team Godzilla. Definitely. I had the Godzilla toys, you know, the Toho night, you know, um, Godzilla 1985, uh, uh, toys. I had those. I'd love to get my hands on an authentic, uh, cause they were supposed to be the Godzilla from 1985. It kind of looked like it, but now I, I think NECA and a few other, uh, companies have made better looking um, Godzilla 1984 or five replicas, which I'd love to get my hands on. But anyway, so big Godzilla fan, always have been, always will be. I am definitely team Godzilla. I am rooting for Godzilla. However, um, you know, we usually know how these things go. And um, I, I believe that, so there's, Two thoughts here, because uh, Cecil Laird of The Horror Show brought this to my attention. So, Cecil, if you're watching, uh, thank you for bringing this to my attention. Uh, apparently, uh, one of, and I'd have to look deeper into this uh, to confirm this, not that I think Cecil's not, you know, telling me the truth, but just to confirm more details on this and, uh, and to confirm whether this is still the case. But there's a reason why uh, the movie uh, was, call, was called Kong Skull Island and not King Kong and why people keep, you know, referring to him as, as Kong, Kong, Kong and not King Kong. Apparently there was a merchandising issue with rights or something like that, according to Cecil. And I want to uh, look into that a bit more. Maybe some people in the chat room have some more information on that. Uh, I want to look into that a bit more and I want to see if that's still the case. Now, I do know that John C. Riley's character, of course, we know in Kong Skull Island, he does say that's Kong. He's king around here. And I know that people think, well, I see he's King Kong. Yes, yes, yes. That's a very sort of inconspicuous way of calling him King Kong without calling him King Kong. Um, but at the same time, it could also be used later on as just a way of foreshadowing his eventual status as King Kong. I saw somebody else uh, mention that on social media the other day, and, and I happen to agree with that. Um, so I think it's interesting that um, because I have this feeling that, you know, Godzilla's known as King of the Monsters. He always has been. He's a god. He's Godzilla. He's King of the Monsters. He's always been called that, by the way. That's not just new to the 2000... Was it last year? Yeah, I think it was last year, right? That's just not new to the movie that just came out. Godzilla, you know, King of the Monsters. No, the, he's always been called that. Um, And I just sort of thought that since Kong hasn't been called King Kong yet, if it is a matter of a rights issue and they get it worked out... This would be a, a, a perfect opportunity to do it. Kong defeats Godzilla and becomes King Kong. This is the movie where he gets his full name, the name you've been waiting for. Because regardless of, of whether or not, I mean, okay, let's say it is a merchandising issue or there's certain rights and they don't have the rights to, okay, let's just say that's all true. And, and, and it could very well be, 100%. I, I mean, I'm sure it is. Um, okay, but, he, but he's King Kong. He's not Kong. I mean, that would be like calling Godzilla Zilla. Yeah, no, he, he, he's not. He's Godzilla. Everybody, 
out in the world of pop culture consciousness, he's King Kong. That's his name. I mean, you can call him Kong for short. Okay, hey, it's Kong. You know, like in the Goonies when Chunk is like, sounds like Kong. You know, I mean, I get it. Yeah, like you can call him that, but he's King Kong. You know, you can call Myers Myers. You can call Freddy Krueger Krueger, but he's Freddy Krueger. I mean, that's his name, you know, and to move into a new phase of existence with the character, not ever calling him King Kong or finding inconspicuous ways to sort of call him King Kong. I don't know. It just, that's, that's his case. It's King Kong. He's been known that for nearly a hundred years, you know? So I, I think there's, there's a, there's a, a, there might be, I'm hoping there's a moment where they can introduce that. Even though I'm Team Godzilla, I think it would be nice for the character and would be nice for the universe, the monster universe that there's that they're building because there's so many more opportunities. I think it would be nice for them to be able to introduce that back into the universe. And this might be a way to do it because right now we know at the end of Godzilla King of the Monsters, it's long live the king, right? Oh, he's king of the monsters. Oh, but does King Kong come along? Does Kong come along and dethrone him? And now he's King Kong. You see what I'm saying? Like from a writing perspective, it, it just fits. It just works. Now, whether they can legally do that, I don't know. I mean, we're going to find out, um, you know, but I can, if they can, if they can do that, and they choose not to do that, I actually think it's a hugely missed opportunity. I mean, even though I'm Team Godzilla, it's a hugely missed, it's a big missed opportunity from a writing perspective. So um, that's my guess is, but you know, like with these kinds of movies, what's probably going to happen is they're going to fight each other and then there's not really going to be a winner, or though, although maybe there will be, maybe there will be, uh, but then they'd have to team up to fight a greater evil you know, um, I don't know. I, I, I just think because Godzilla essentially won in the last movie, I have a hard time believing he's going to win, at least with any sort of certainty, you know, with any sort of clarity uh, that he's going to win for sure in this. He is the winner because he just won. He just won. You know what I mean? And I think now it's like, you know, and let's not forget, I mean, Godzilla is a Japanese creation. King Kong, as far as I know, is an American creation. So, I mean, you know, this could be, you know, Hollywood's opportunity to put a, put a you know, uh, America, yeah, fuck yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't, um, you can't underestimate the possibility of those things you know so uh you know i just see king kong winning or at least winning in a way that is kind of winning but it leaves it open for revenge or something i don't know um but i don't see godzilla i hate to say it and i could be wrong and i hope i am because i'm team godzilla i just i would be stunned if godzilla won the fight like at the end of the movie he won and he's the clear winner like there's no like oh well no no he fucking won i mean maybe he took some serious damage because you gotta have that i mean there's got to be resistance there right but at the end no godzilla's the clear winner I i'd be surprised i'd be happy because i'm team godzilla but i would be surprised i'd be like wow you know and again from a writing perspective i don't even know if that's a good thing to do you know, when you want to build a universe because there's always an opportunity for Kong and Godzilla to fight again, for Godzilla to to win. And then maybe they have the rubber match, right? You know, I mean, there's always, there's always that possibility. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about it. And in terms of the movie itself, listen, this is a monster movie, okay? I didn't like, I didn't really like 2014's Godzilla, because Gareth Edwards uh, was implementing what's known now as the Jaws effect, right? Where you keep the antagonist, whatever you know, whatever that is at bay, and uh, you keep dangling the carrot, but you don't show too much, and that's fine, and that can be implemented, and a very powerful creative tool when you have interesting and well developed three dimensional characters that we can, you know, ride along with. 
you can't do that when your characters are cookie cutter, one dimensional and uninteresting, you know, like in Jaws. And of course it was accidental in Jaws. They had to do that because the shark wasn't working, right? We know that. I mean, I don't need to get into that. We know how all that works. So it was sort of a happy accident as Bob Ross would say. Um, but the characters in Jaws, I mean, Jaws, yeah, it's a horror movie, but it's, it's a, it's a, drama as well i mean there's it's so, the characters are so well developed they're so interesting that and the dynamic between everybody is so rich and amazing that you don't need that like when the shark's not on screen you don't care you don't care because you're so interested in the dynamics between everybody and the chemistry and the relationships and the everything going on and it just makes everything else that much more rich Godzilla had none of that Godzilla had I mean the most interesting character was Brian Cranston he was uh, spoiler alert killed in the first like half hour of the movie so nobody cares nobody cares at least I didn't care I, I thought it looked great Godzilla was cool it was an interesting new incarnation of him great okay this is great but man it was most of a snooze fest there, right? A lot of people were complaining that Godzilla King of the Monsters, the one that just came out last year, I guess, um, that, oh, there was, you know, that the characters sucked. And it's like, well, yeah, but what they did was they gave you, they delivered on the monster aspect. The characters in Godzilla King of the Monsters were serviceable. They were serviceable. They weren't really rich and well-developed. They were just not quite cookie cutter, but, you know, serviceable, right? I didn't not care about them. I didn't overly care about them. They were serviceable, but it was a monster movie. And that's what this is, is a monster movie. The spectacle was there. The explosions were there. All the monsters were there. The fire, the fights, the crumbling, the, it was great, and then you had serviceable characters to keep it, you know, relatively interesting when the monsters were not on screen. I was okay with it, you know? And in these kinds of movies, that's what they are. That's what they are. Um, and so I'm okay with that. So I, I imagine that this movie will be, I mean, this is a clash of the Titans. This is a clash of arguably the two most famous monsters in the monsters like this I'm talking about. Like real, like God-like, you know, gigantic monsters not like freddy krueger or jason or michael who you could think of as monsters or frankenstein or dragon i'm talking about like titans right they call them the titans for a reason god-like you know epic creatures uh king kong and godzilla godzilla and king kong are arguably two of the most famous in history so i mean i have no doubt that there will be blood there will be carnage there will be explosions and incredible shit you know which i am really looking forward to because uh you know i'm excited i'm excited but yeah it's a cool image i mean you know but you know i mean it, it's cool to see that image but it's not an image per se from the movie, so I, I don't know, but, but it's gonna look like that. I mean, it will look like that, so pretty cool stuff. But yeah, no, Kong has grown. Kong has grown to become Godzilla's size. Godzilla has not shrunk to become Kong's size. So let's uh, um, uh, just remember that, okay? Uh, that is my understanding of the situation. Um, this depiction of Godzilla and King Kong is about as classic as ever. Kong swinging a right hook while Godzilla looks like he might go for the belly. All the while, humans are hope are hopelessly, um, oh, there we go. Pelting them. Sorry, I was like, what does that say? Font's a little small on my screen. Pelting them with bullets. Giant monsters aside, I have a hard time believing an aircraft carrier could realistically hold both Titans without capsizing. But hey, where do things have happened in the, in the Godzilla universe? Well, again, this isn't... Now, again, maybe it's been confirmed. I don't know. But because this is concept art, at least that's what he's calling it here, um, this isn't necessarily true. I mean, Godzilla and Kong don't necessarily, you know... Uh, walk across an aircraft carrier. I mean, it's, it's just a cool image, you know, and you needed something in the image to give them scale. I mean, that's what it's really about here, right? Is that you want something uh, to give the monster scale because without the aircraft carrier and without the little helicopters there, 
you don't get a sense of how big they are unless they're standing next to a, a you know, a tree or a, 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 a light post or something. So it's all about giving the monsters scale. And, uh, but whether or not they actually walk across an aircraft carrier and who knows. But again, if they do, this is a caption. It's a, it's a still, who's to say they're walking across it? I mean, as Kong steps into his punch, I mean, maybe the whole aircraft goes and just like tips over and they all fall. I mean, who knows, right? We don't know. I mean, we're just seeing a very, it's, it's, it's a still image. It's, it's a still frame. So, and it's not even a frame from the movie. <laughs> so who knows folks, who knows? Um, and of course, uh, the other thing I want to talk about today is the uh, Chucky teaser, the Chucky TV series from Don Mancini. Uh, he's been working on this for quite some time, and uh, he is, uh, the teaser trailer <laughs> uh, was released, was it last week, I guess, and, um, you know, I'm I'm just here to basically say that uh, I, I made a, a, a tweet about this, and I, I genuinely believe this, and, and it, 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 it never see, and, but I think I know the reasons why. It never ceases to amaze me in the world of fandom how, how people get so excited over so little, over nothing. But I think the reason for that is largely because, especially when you're dealing with a property that has a problematic history, like Child's Play. And what I mean by problematic, listen, everybody, you know, look, I mean, everybody has their tastes. And if you like all the films, great. I don't. Um, I think most of them are dog shit. Uh, you know, there's a reason why it, it, it fell apart and, you know, um, I don't, it, it, Child's Play, okay, let me start here. Child's Play is an interesting series for me because the first Child's Play I love, I think it's a great horror movie and you don't even see Chucky as Chucky, like, rah, 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 until the mom notices that there's no batteries and she's threatening to um, throw him in the fire. And that's when he's like, you bitch. And that's the first time we actually see Chucky. Look at the timestamp. It's like 45 or 50 minutes into the movie. Everything up to that point is all through the power of suggestion, zooming very closely on the, you know, the good guy doll eyes, you know, and, and just like, just, and just like feet and, and POV. And, and it's, it's just great. It's great, right? It's a creepy film. Uh, I don't mind Child's Play 2. I think it's pretty good. I don't like it as much as the first one, but it's fine. You get to Child's Play 3, and that's where I sort of begin to, it begins to lose me. Now, I will admit that I have not seen, uh, from start to finish, uh, the rest of the Child's Play films. I've seen, I've seen bits and pieces of them. I've seen all the trailers. I've talked to people who've watched them. Um, and it just doesn't interest me. Child's Play and Chucky became very gimmicky to me. It's already gimmicky from the get-go because it's a doll that's two and a half feet tall that by any measure really shouldn't be able to inflict the damage that he does, right? So there's a sense of believability that, you know, has a shelf life, like a lot of horror films do. But with Chucky, it's like, you know, when he starts getting married and you introduce other dolls and it becomes just like a carnival act. Like it just, I just don't care. It's just too gimmicky to me. It's too self-aware. It's just chintzy. It's chintzy. It's, it's, but what else are you going to do with it? Right. You know, like you, you can only create a serious horror movie like the original Child's Play was for so long until people are going to go, okay, come on, just fucking kick the fucking doll in the face and let's go. Like, I mean, there's only so much you can do. Right. Um, so I get it. I understand that they had to evolve it that way. So I'm not a, I'm not really a fan of the series. I'm really not. I like the first movie. I like the second movie. The third one, you know, and then I, I've watched bits and pieces of Seed and Cult and, and, and Bride. And I'm just like, this is so like, I feel like I'm watching a real chintzy bad episode of Freddy's Nightmares from 1988 or something. Like it just feels, I just don't like it. I just don't like it. But Don Mancini, of course, is now taking, you know, Child's Play to the small screen and he's taking it to a TV series. We have no idea what that's going to be like because Don Mancini is not only responsible for the first Child's Play, he's responsible for the shittiest Child's Plays in the series too. So, I mean, I don't know what this is going to be like. Am I excited? Not really, you know. I mean, I think uh, What's-Her-Face... Um, Jennifer Tilly, is that her name? 
Was she the one that was in the, is that her name? Um, is it Jennifer Tilly? Chat will let me know. Is it Jennifer Tilly? Let me know, chat. Is that, is that the, uh, yes. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate it. Um, well, that doesn't excite me. I get that she's a big part of the child's play universe now, but it's not like that excites someone like me because I'm just like, well, I just don't like the ones she's in. You know, like, I'm just like, well, that doesn't really excite me, you know? And um, I listened very carefully to what Cody Leach had to say about this because Cody Leach, to, you know, is a child's play expert and, and he knows a lot about this. You know, it's like how I listen to Cecil Laird when it comes to Elms. And it's not that I don't know a lot about these films. I do. But of course, you know, I would be like a GP, like a general practitioner when it comes to like, you know, child's play. Right. And then if I need to consult a specialist, I consult a specialist. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I kind of see it. Right. With Halloween, it's a different story. I consider myself an expert in that area. But but certainly when it comes to to uh, Friday the 13th or somebody like that, I know enough. I mean, I, I know a lot. Uh, but. But when there's there's certain nitty gritty stuff that, you know, only the sweaty, you know, <laughs> the sweaty guys know all about, right? Like how I am with Halloween or, you know, the Halloween uh, universe. So um, I listened very carefully to what Cody Leach had to say about this. And I could not agree more with him. I could not agree more. I, I'm not excited. This teaser trailer does nothing for me. Yeah, but Dave, it had the Child's Play 2 theme. Who cares? Who cares? It doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. The Child's Play 2 theme might not even be in the series. It might not even be in the series. We have no idea. No idea. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me once, sorry. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me once. <laughs> Let me try that again. I feel like George Bush. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, never get fooled again or something. Remember when he said that? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me is the actual uh, saying. And so I feel like that. I feel like that in a lot of cases with, um, with this kind of stuff. I mean, it's not that the TV series won't be good, but there's nothing in this teaser that says yay or nay, you know? And yeah, they're tapping into the nostalgia of the Child's Play 2 theme, but it's it's an animated teaser. It's an animated teaser. I mean, there's some people out there that think this is going to be an animated TV show, and it's not. It's live action. I mean, the thing's been shot, for Christ's sakes. And, and, and... I just, you know, and, and, um, I see, I wouldn't have known this, but Cody Leach says this and I take his word for it. Cause I, I, again, he's, he's, he's the expert in this, but at the very end of the teaser, of course, you have, uh, Chucky, Brad, um, Dorf laughing, you know, <laughs> or whatever he does. Right. And I, and of course that's Chucky's laugh. And I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, it's Chucky's laugh. But Cody was like, well, yeah, it's Chucky's laugh, but it's a soundbite that's been out there for years because I've used it on many occasions on my videos. So it's not like it's even a new laugh from the TV show. Now, I don't know that, and I'm, but according to Cody, that's the case. And I'm like, well, Cody's a child's play expert. So, I was like, so if he says that, I, you know, I'll, I'll take his word for it, you know? So it's not even like a new soundbite. It's a soundbite from probably a movie of 20 years ago. Who knows, right? Um, not that that's not cool. You know, it's signifying that, hey, this isn't Mark Hamill's Chucky. This is, you know, Brad Dorff's Chucky. I get it. Totally get it. Um, and it's a well-produced, little teaser. It looks great, but it doesn't get me excited because I've been burned so many times. You've been burned so many times. And I think the reason why people get so excited over so little, it's like the Halloween teaser. <laughs> There's nothing there. There's nothing there. I think, but again, I think the reason why people get so excited is because They've been burned so many times and they're desperate. And I think there's a large population of the of fandom in the horror community, whether it's Friday the 13th, whether it's A Nightmare on Elm Street, whether it's Halloween, whether it's Child's Play, whether it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, whether it's Scream, you know, whatever. Although Scream, I think, is probably the less burned fan base because it's not like, it's not like the Scream movies, there aren't really any awful scream movies right i mean part three was like eh, you know kind of the novelty had been wearing off by then it was kind of a, it didn't feel like the ending people wanted but it's not a 
awful movie. It's not like Halloween five or Halloween resurrection, right? Or, or, you know, Freddy's dead or Jason goes to hell. I mean, it's not like scream. Although then again, scream only has four installments. So let's, let's keep that in mind too. Um, but you know, there, there are, there is a large population of the fan base that is genuinely, you know, desperate. They're desperate for something something that is going to get them excited, something that they can glom onto of hope, some glimmer of hope, something. And Child's Play is, you know, it's, it's some people like the, the whole series. A lot of people don't. Some people like certain installments. Oh, I like Cults, but I don't like Curse. I like Curse, but I don't like uh, Cults. Cult, but I don't like Curse. I like Curse, but I don't like Cult. I hate Bride, but like Seed. Hate Seed, but like Bride. Who knows? I hate them all like me, you know, except for the first couple. I mean, and I think when you see this, People are, are just, oh, there's the Child's Play 2 theme. Oh, there's Brad Torres laugh. Oh, there's there's this, there's that, there's this. And I think people just, they get real. Oh, there's the store. It's a store. It's a kid's in shelves. Oh, and there's Chucky standing there, you know, looking at, oh, they're, they're desperate. They're desperate everything. It's like, you know, the Halloween, let it burn. Let, hey, she said, let it. She said it. Ah! It's like, holy fuck. It's nothing. It's nothing. I mean, think of how excited people were for the trailers for H18. How did that work out? Hey, there's a lot of people that like H18, right? But I'm just saying, you know, the job of a trailer, the job of a teaser or a full length trailer is, is to get you excited, you know, is to, and they, they, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's like my, it's me, Billy teaser. I mean, let's be honest here, right? Does that mean the movie's going to be good? No, no. I mean, we're going to do everything we can to deliver something that's amazing for you, right? But most people, as far as I know, love the It's Me Billy Indiegogo teaser. Oh my God, oh my God. You know, if the movie is even 80% of what this is, it's going to be great. I agree. I think we did a really good job on it. The fucking movie hasn't even been shot yet. By the way, go to the Indiegogo campaign. The link is in the description. Help us out. Come on, folks. You got to help us out. Let's go. We got to keep going here, folks. Anything you can donate, any perks you can, you know, help to um, contribute to, we appreciate it. We love you guys. Shameless plug. I'll plug again at the end of the show. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, we are setting ourselves up to give us the best probability of success. We've hired a professional DP who's working at the top of his game. We're hoping to shoot on the area Alexa or the Red. Uh, we got professional actors. We got locations. We got, I mean, we're, we're a professional crew. We're, we're going to deliver a high production value film. But the job of a teaser is to do what it does to you, you know, and it's OK to be excited about it. It's OK to be excited about it. But I have yet to make anything that's burned people. Mancini has. Mancini's made a lot of dog shit, you know? And I just think, and he's in charge of this again. So as Cody Leach said, I reserve judgment because, you know, I think he said something like, am I going to get this Mancini or am I going to get this Mancini? And I agree. We don't know. We don't know. And you can't get that from this teaser. But listen, if people are excited, that's great. But I think at the end of the day, the reason why people are excited, again, is because of the desperation. You're desperate for something really good with original Chucky, you know, 19 film, which, you know, I mean, a lot of people like that movie. A lot of people did. Um, you know, I, I, I think it wasn't as bad as, as people thought it was going to be. Um, there, it does have its fans, but at the end of the day, people really want that old school Chucky. And I, and I think that that's, uh, primarily what, what, um, you know, what people are desperate for. And so they see a teaser like this and it gets them really excited. And the series is called Chucky. It's going to be airing on sci-fi, I guess. Uh, I've seen, I, I get, uh, sci-fi, but I, I don't really watch it really. And, and, uh, I saw some people in the comment section of the, um, of the teaser saying things like, oh, well, if it's on sci-fi, then, you know, it'll be canceled after two seasons. I guess that's a, it's a, it's a quip and a jab at sci-fi. I guess sci-fi, do they have a history of, of, um, uh, green lighting series and then for whatever reason whether it's ratings or who knows i mean it usually is that um then they cancel it i mean maybe that's a thing they do i have no idea kelly barkley says sci-fi in usa thank you kelly um so there you go so you know i don't know who's got the primary uh one for that <laughs> darren sand says from the network that brought you shark to puss well that's what i'm talking about right so 
And you know, as a series, it may do well. I mean, it, it might, it might be very interesting. But again, I mean, how far can you go with, with this character? It's just, Chucky to me is, he's just a, I, it's, he's a freak show. He's a sideshow. He's, it's, I don't, I don't see the long, as funny as it sounds, I just don't see the longevity or the long-term appeal for that character. You know, it, it just, I think it's because I just think at some point somebody would just fucking, it's a doll. It's a doll. Your doll? Your doll? Chucky did it. Your doll? Where are you going? To find Chucky. She says that so like, to find Chucky in the first movie. Anyway, um, love that movie. But, you know, now it's like, what? You know, <laughs> I'm thinking, Jesus Christ. Like, and we don't even know what this is going to be about. So that, you know, I'm interested. I'm, I will watch it. I will tune into at least the first episode, to, you know, the pilot to, to see what, what it's like. Um, but yeah, I mean, am I excited? Well, no. I mean, I, I've been burned so many times with Chucky that I'm just like, I'm not excited about it. You know, I hope it's good. I really do. And I hope more for you Child's Play fans. I hope more for, you know, the Cody Leeches of the world, right? That are really big, that want something really great from Child's Play. I mean, really, at the end of the day, I couldn't care less whether they made another Child's Play movie or incarnation of Chucky ever. I just don't care. It's not a property that I ever became really emotionally attached to. Like I said, really liked that first movie, really enjoyed the second one. Uh, but as a whole, as a series, I, I just don't care. I just don't, you know, I'm, it, it's not there for me. So I'm hoping it's good because I'd love to watch a cool Chucky series. Who wouldn't? But I'm really hoping it's good for those of you that are that are like to Chucky what I am to like Halloween or something, right? Or um, or something like that. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm really rooting for you guys because, you, I mean, it's, you know, you guys deserve that, right? But I'm just really skeptical, you know? And I think it's good to be skeptical because again, it's Don Mancini. And Don Mancini is, has been in, you know, he's he's been responsible for every Child's Play movie you've gotten. So are you going to get 88 Mancini or are you going to get, you know, mid-90s Mancini? Or, I mean, who knows? I don't know, you know? Or is it going to be a hybrid of both? I mean, that's entirely possible as well. So I have no idea, but um, I do know that, you know, I'm yeah, just didn't do much for me. Um, it didn't do much. Like the Halloween <laughs> teaser. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Sure, it's cool. It's not a bad teaser. I'm not saying it's a bad teaser. It's not a bad teaser at all. It's cool. But there's not, like I've said, again, I think because the Halloween fans are so desperate and have been let down because by now we would have had a full length trailer. We would have had a poster. And we would know a lot more about what's going to happen in Halloween Kills. And if there was no COVID-19. But we've got nothing. It's been pushed another year. If this teaser trailer for Halloween Kills had, as I said, had come out, you know, before the pandemic, like maybe had come out in January, people would have been like, oh, that's cool, cool. But I don't think it would have gotten the whoa, ho, ho, oh, that it's apparently getting from some people because people are desperate for anything. So you give them a little nugget of something and it feels bigger than it really is. And as I said on a previous show, you know, I find the featurette that they released on Halloween last year far more telling and far more interesting than the teaser they released a couple of weeks ago. I mean, that was just uh, to, you know, throw everybody a bone because they were delivering bad news. You know what I mean? But I, f I found that featurette way more interesting. There was a lot more things you could decipher and speculate on in there than this teaser. I mean, and it's not a bad teaser. It's fine. It's, it's a, I don't even call it a teaser. It's 30 seconds long. It's like a TV spot. So it's a great TV spot. Um, but, you know, <laughs> okay. You know, the coolest thing for me, like I said, is at the, at the end of the teaser when Michael turns and you see the bit of the, very bit of the left side of his mask and you're like, oh, it's totally burned. It's totally burned. That's going to be cool. That's how I think about it. 
Hey, let's move over to the chat room and see what you guys are saying. What do you guys think of the image for Godzilla versus Kong? What do you guys think of the Chucky teaser trailer? Are you excited? Are you not excited? Let me know in the comment section uh, below if you're watching after the uh, show and uh, certainly in the chat room there if you want to uh, get in on it as well. Let's uh, Some super chats did come in. Let's see your Intel Wild, my man, says, Yo, Dave, we're going to make it rain on Saturday for It's Me, Billy. I hope so, man. Yeah, for those of you that don't know uh, what Intel is talking about, of course, this Saturday, this Saturday, July the 25th, 2020, at uh, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's five hours, myself and Bruce. Bruce will be in studio with me here. Uh, we will have a two-camera setup, two-microphone setup. He will be in studio with me. We are doing our first, uh, maybe our only one, I don't know, but we... We, we might do another one. We'll see how this one goes first. Um, our first It's Me Billy a thon, where we will be taking nothing but super chat questions uh, for the whole five hours. Five hours, folks. We may even have some, some surprises for you in there as well. And um, all super chats everything raised via the Super Chats goes towards the Indiegogo campaign. And once that comes in, it won't come to me right away because obviously I have to wait till Google pays me through AdSense. Uh, but once that portion of the Super Chats comes in, uh, it will be uh, put towards the Indiegogo campaign. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so, so we're really excited about that. And of course, we will encourage you to make donations as well. You can do that because keep in mind to be totally transparent and this is not like it's anything i mean it's not for me i mean this is for everybody youtube does take 30 percent of every one super chat so if you send in ten dollars really only seven dollars goes to me so you have to keep that in mind as well no sorry is it? yeah that's right so seven dollars so that's just that's the reality for everybody whether you're a gigantic channel or a little channel like mine uh that is the reality of the situation but we don't want to discourage people sending in super chats because the more people that send in of course it does add up and we will announce the tally and the total at the end of the athon at 4 p.m or close to it and uh so people know how much we've raised but we're really excited about it we want to keep this train going things have slowed down a lot with the campaign as we knew it would we've just crossed thirty four thousand dollars Canadian. Uh, so we want to keep that going. Uh, we have about 43, 44 days left in the campaign. So about five, five weeks or so, uh, five and a half weeks. But uh, we got to keep this going. Um, and uh, so that's what's happening this Saturday. That's what Intel is talking about. We will encourage people to make donations, of course, and buy perks as well, because there will be there's a lot left. There's a lot left. And if you got uh, five bucks burning a hole in your pocket and you want to throw it our way, but you don't want to super chat it, you can donate it to the campaign as well, because there's a little there, there's a donate button that you can uh, you can click on there as well. So we would appreciate that, too. Um, now, donations are not associated with any perks, but we really do appreciate it nonetheless. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's what that is all about. So we're really excited about that, Intel. Thank you for bringing that up. Intel Wild follows up with, can't wait to see what surprises you and Bruce have for us on the It's Me Billiathon. Well, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not crazy surprises. I just mean that there's going to be a little more than just myself and Bruce talking for five hours is what I'm saying. It's not like we've invited, you know, uh, oh my God, we've got uh, the director of, of, of so-and-so of, 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 of Scream. He's, he's uh, of, uh, you know, the new uh, part five, he's on. He wants to, it's not like that kind of stuff, folks. But, you know, we'll see, we'll see. There, there might be a few little things in there. Um, uh, Recan Man 85 sends in a super chat. Thank you, buddy. Says, I think we are forgetting about the elevated intelligence of a primate along with the ability to use hands and feet. Kong has a lot going. He does. Oh, ab oh especially at that size. It's really all about size, right? You can have, uh, you can be a, a an intelligent primate like we are who have hands and feet, but going up against Godzilla, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's really at the end of the day, you have to have the size. Now you can have the size and not the smarts and still, you know, might, might lose. But if you have the size and you're flailing away and doing all these things, I mean, you can still cause some damage. Um, it's really about a combination of the two that you are referring to. And you're right. No doubt about it though. He does have a lot going if he's that big. The film addict says donated to your campaign last night. I saw that man. Thank you so much. Planning to donate again soon. Would really appreciate that man going, uh, going to the drive-in tonight with some friends. So that should be fun. Hey, have a great time. Uh, Man 85 
Follows up with in the old in the old movie, people gave uh, Kong the king label, but this story has been different. The natives always just called him Kong. That's true too. That's true too. But you're right. But in the pop culture consciousness, he's always been known as King Kong. So it would seem strange to me if he was never referred to as King Kong, because that really is his name. He is King Kong. That's his name. Now, you can retcon that, which is kind of like what they've done, um, but it feels strange to me that he's just always referred to as Kong because people call him King Kong anyway. I mean, how many of your friends have been like, hey, I can't wait till Godzilla versus King Kong comes out. And it's like, well, actually, it's just called Godzilla versus... P people call him because that's his name. That's his name. So I'm hoping that they can reintroduce that in some ways that in, in, in some way that seems genuine and authentic because uh, I think that's important to me. Uh, or Im important to the character, actually. Uh, SBC Bird 3171993 sends in a super chat. Thank you, buddy. He says, hey, Dave. So I just watched the OG Black Christmas a few days ago. And wow, can you tell me why we don't see Billy and why he stalks the girls? No, I can't tell you that. I, I have no idea. You're not supposed to know that, right? That's part of the wow of the original Black Christmas um, is that the whole point was uh, to keep the antagonist, Billy, um, in the shadows and and uh, to keep the enigma there. And remember, this is, you know, it, it predates Halloween by four years. Um, this was it made it creepier. There was a intent to keep him in the shadows, to, to not show his face, to not show him, to not have any backstory and to utilize the crazy, obscene, incoherent phone calls uh, as a way to give you insight and clues into who Billy is and his backstory. If you pay very close attention to the obscene phone calls, and it's hard, it's difficult because you have to decipher. It's like, you know, deciphering a code. Um, but if you pay close attention, and there's YouTube videos that have already done it, so you can cheat and certainly find out. But if you pay close attention, there there is a, uh, there is a coherency within the incoherency, if I could say it like that. Um, there are certain things Billy says that do give you little clues into the a bigger picture of what might be going on. Not necessarily the why he's chosen this sorority house, but uh, what's going on with him, okay? Uh, but you have to pay very close attention to the uh, phone calls. It's done very inconspicuously. It's brilliant. And why he chose that sorority house and he's fucked up, man. I don't know. But that's that's what makes it so creepy. It's so eerie, you know, and never and just that eye shot. Oh, the eye shot's unbelievable. So um I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you watched it. Uh and well, yeah, I'm I'm more glad that you enjoyed it. And thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Uh TMB sends in a super chat says and says, Dave, what song brings you back to the 90s when you hear it? Uh any 90s song, I guess? I'm <laughs> just kidding. Uh mine is when I hear the first chords of my own worst enemy, even though I was young. What song? Well, I mean, any 90s song that would that was popular when I was in high school. So I, I would say that would be anything from you know, like, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, if you if I hear like the Macarena or the Macarena, is that how you say it? Whatever, like that song, right? You guys remember that one? You know, I mean, that brings me back to to high school. Um, UB40, the band UB40, you know, uh, Boys to Men, uh, and a, a lot of dance songs, you know, um, the real McCoy, that dance group, the real McCoy, like anything, like anything that's a nineties song. If I were to hear it, I'm like, Oh, it's, I'm instantly like walking through the halls of my high school. You know what I mean? So, uh, I would say anything. I, I don't think there's really any one specifically that I'm like, oh, uh, it'd be anything. It would be anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Terrell Sims sends in a super chat. Thank you, Terrell, for supporting the channel. Appreciate that. Uh, 
D, 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 Devon is awesome. Devon is awesome. Maybe that's it. Uh, thanks, buddy. Uh, for the super chat says, hey, Dave, off topic, off topic. But what are you hoping H kills does the most? For me, it's more stalking and tension in scenes as well as fleshed out characters. I, I'd agree with that. I just want more. Yeah, more suspense. You know, more more tension, uh, less gratuitous. You know, again, you know, we're not going to get that. But as I've said before, too, you know, people have to keep in mind that. Listen, we know we've known. I knew this. This I knew this before it was even announced. I knew that if they were going to do a sequel to Halloween Kills, that it would be more violent. I mean, that's just that's just that's a very high probability that a sequel is generally more violent than the original in the world of horror. Uh, so. That didn't surprise me, and especially when they announced that the name is Halloween Kills. Um, yeah, I just don't want, uh, of course, we know that it's probably going to have the highest body count out of any Halloween movie. We know that. Maybe out of any of the big three. Who knows? Um, we know it's going to be uber violent. We know that. But I, I was quick to point out that violence doesn't necessarily equate to uh, gore. It can, but they're not always mutually exclusive to each other. You can have very intense violence and intense kills, but not necessarily gore. You might see some blood, but it's not necessarily gory. So I'm very curious on how they're going to approach that because as I've said many times, I don't want Michael to become like Jason. He's not Jason Voorhees. He's Michael Myers. And part of his MO is lurking and stalking and being more um, subtle ab about his approach. He's not a loose cannon. He's just not. And, and to make him unhinged in some ways feels not consistent with his character. But at the same time, if you try to kill two birds with one stone and you introduce a lot of stalking and lurking and they're not there, but you, you know, even that out with a bunch of gruesome kills and it might, like I've always said, it would it'd be a weird dichotomy for me. So, but to answer your question directly, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm hoping that there's more of that. More nuance, just more nuance and paying attention to what made his character so eerie and creepy. It's not about the kills. It's about everything that leads up to the kills. The kills in the original Halloween are not that interesting. They're really not. You know, I mean, sure, back in the day, I mean, it was fun. But I mean, you know, Linda gets strangled with a phone cord. That, okay, great. Everybody gets strangled. Bob gets strangled. Annie gets strangled. Linda gets strangled. You know, uh, Judith doesn't, of course. And we don't know about the mechanic, who I always refer to as F Freddie Mercury. Uh, but it's, I mean, they're they're fun, you know, phone cord in the, you know, the, in, you know, the back of the car. But it's everything that leads up to that. You know, it's the suspense. It's the, you know, <laughs> no keys, but, play. and you know, it's that building, you know, and you hear like, you know, the wind as she's walking from the garage back into the house, she's combing her hair and then she walks back to the, you know, and gets inside and she's like, wait a minute, I didn't unlock the door. And what? <laughs> Huh? And then boom, oh my God. And then that shot through the, through the fogged glass, right? Through the fogged glass, the shot, I just want to bring you guys up there. There you are. Um, the shot through the fogged glass. What a great way to mask, to make Michael blurry, right? To give him that ghostly shape. The window's fogged up, you know, and shooting through that. Like it's, it's that kind of shit that makes Michael awesome. That makes it enjoyable to watch. The building of the suspense, the nurturing of that care, the tender love and care, the TLC that's put into that. Because if you don't have that, then he's just Jason killing people. You know, I want to see him emerging from the darkness. It's one of the things that I said, listen, it works the way they did it. But again, I've often said that Halloween 18 to me was a, a, a what they did well, they did really well, but it was mostly for me a film of missed opportunities. Like when he, he, he comes out from behind the mannequins to attack Lori. Okay. That works. Totally works. Totally works. 100%. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But what a great opportunity you have 
to Lori to be looking at the mannequins. Maybe she's backing up. And then all of a sudden you start to see his face emerging from the darkness. I know it's an overused cliche with me, emerging from the dark. But that's part of that's what he does. And how cool. Imagine you sitting in the theater, you know, and you're sitting there and all of a sudden it's like, and you're like, ah, you would be. You would have been. Because, why? Be, not because it's something you haven't seen before. Not because it's something you may not have expected. But because it's what he does. That's him, you know, and you nurture that and you nurture the character. You, you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to oversaturate it. You don't want him emerging from the darkness like that every kill he does in a movie. But it's things like that. It's that lurking and stalking and it's the journey that builds up to the end result. You know, it's not the end result. It's not about the kill. It's about the lead up to it, the suspense that you build up to it, you know, because then it makes the kill that much more fulfilling and interesting, you know, because it's just so cool to watch, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you there. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, let's see. David Lee Barron sends in a super chat and says, the question isn't, do they like you? The question is, are they reading you? Earl McRae. Yeah. Earl would be E-A-R-L. But, but yes, that was, that was my dad. My dad said, uh, the question is not whether they like you or hate you. The question is, are they reading you? Uh, and that's what he said to me. I remembered I was in his office. I was probably, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe 17. I don't know. Uh, and he was going through, he showed me a piece of, hate mail that of course it was what was it an email i don't think it was an email because email wasn't i mean email existed but it was i mean i didn't have my first email address till i was 19 so um it was probably a letter or a letter to the editor at the paper maybe or something i don't know anyway i remember him saying that and i was like that's very insightful dad very very insightful yeah my dad had pretty thick skin um where are you guys here? There we go. And let's see. Uh, Brandon Barry. Brandon Barry sends a super chat. Says, Dave, thoughts on Blue Jays not being able to play in Toronto? Eh, I mean, you know, I'm disappointed because obviously I, I like to go to a couple of, of course, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have been able to go because I don't think they're allowing people in the stands, but it would have been nice to to watch some games from Toronto on the, on the tube. Um, you know, uh, I believe the province of Ontario said it was okay. The city of Toronto, I think, approved it. Uh, but the federal government the canadian government was like uh -uh, nope so they're either going to play in dunedin, dunedin i think that's how you say that in florida which is where their spring training camp f um facilities are or they're going to play in buffalo which is where their triple a affiliate is so you know meh yeah it is what it is you know too bad i mean i think at the end of the day because nobody's allowed to go to the game anyway or yeah i don't think we'd be allowed to go uh of course, stage three, we're moving into phase three soon. I don't know how, anyway, I, it doesn't bother me. I mean, no, it, it's not that big of a deal at the end of the day. Uh, super chat from Reese Wilson. Reese, my man, thank you very much. Says, hey, Dave, Team Godzilla. Yes, hashtag Team Godzilla. Have you seen Godzilla versus, oh, how do I say that? Bil Bilanti? Bio, Biolanti? Biolanti? How do you say that, man? No, I haven't. Fun film with some of the most ambitious effects uh, of the franchise, in my opinion. Really? Really? Am I saying that? Biolanti, Biolanti, Bio Or maybe I'm just, I'm overthinking it. Let me just move this. I'm going to do this now because I'm probably overthinking it. Dun, 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 dun. Probably overthinking it. Japanese. It's Japanese. Biolanti, Biolanti, Biolanti. Is it? I haven't seen this. Dude, I'm just looking this up right now. Fuck yes. This is one I haven't seen. Oh, I'm totally down. Biolant. Bio, maybe it's Biolant. Maybe the E-Silent. Biolant. Again, guys, as a voice actor, when I see words that can be said a couple of different ways, uh, I tend to instinctually, phonetically sound them out. So I apologize for the humor sometimes when it's like, is that, is that how you say that? Is that, is that... Uh, Wait. Oh no. Wait, I'm back. I'm back. There was a bit of a there was a bit of a hiccup there, but I'm back. It looks like I'm back. I'm back. Sorry about that, folks. Duke Fleet says Bialanti. So it's Bialanti. 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 Okay. 
Okay. Bialanti, 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 Bialanti. Interesting. I've never heard of this character, which is weird because is he a new a new character? Because I know like all, all all the old ones like King King uh, Ghidra and Megalon and um, uh, Gigon or or and uh, like that, all all the old ones, but I've never heard of this guy. Interesting. Interesting. I'll have to check it out, Reese. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Super Chat comes in from Devin is awesome again. Uh, Devon. Ha -ha. Oh, Devon. Okay. Well, I, you got it. Devon. Okay. Uh, do you think there's still potential for a fresh, unique, well done chainsaw movie or has the novelty worn off? No, I think there is. I think there is. Um, but I just don't think Leatherface is as popular. I, I just, I, I think there is, but I, I just don't think that Look, there are some franchises that just have shorter shelf lives than others. And I just think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of them. Also, too, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, largely as a series, is dog shit. I mean, there was the first one in 1974, which took itself seriously. It's very dated now, obviously, but it's, you know, it's not a... It's, but then there was the almost black comedy sequel 10 years later with Dennis Hopper. Why was, why was the tone suddenly so different? That's a rhetorical question, but I mean, I think, and then of course you get to three, which was kind of, and then four, of course, I think is the one with Matthew McConaughey. And if I'm not mistaken, I just don't think it's been a largely good series, you know, or had enough good movies to remain in the pop culture on a level that people were excited about. You know, generally people like the first one, the remake from Platinum Dunes, which was a great remake. And that's it. And I think people like this. The, there are people that like the second one, but they like it in the ways that you like. It's like a guilty pleasure, you know, at least from my understanding. So, you know, it's it's just not one of those things that, that I mean, yes, I do think there's an opportunity, but I almost feel like do, I, I almost feel like you got to start from scratch again, you know, because I know that they're trying to do a sequel again to the original. It's like, yeah, but... There's so many people that just don't know, like, I just don't see it. I don't see it having the long, they've tried, they tried, you know, and, and, uh, look, he, he's an iconic character. He always will be. Um, he's up there, you know, but I just think that it's largely because of its weak series that he just never gained any traction really, you know? So I just don't think the demand is there. You know, and although Freddie and Jason, they had bad movies, they they eclipsed some, they just entered the pop culture consciousness in ways that Leatherface could only dream of. You know, there was just something about Jason and Freddie and, and, and Michael to an extent, but Michael really didn't, not to the ways that Freddie and Jason did, you know, um, and, and you know. It's just the way it happens, right? It's it's the pulse of pop culture. And sometimes these things are predictable, sometimes they're not. And Leatherface, for me, is just not something that has ever really eclipsed that. You know, it's there, but he's always been, like, on the level of Chucky and, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, Hellraiser. And, you know, he, he, he's there, but he's, he, he's not going to... I don't think you could make a... You might be able to get a TV series, you know, like a Netflix or a Hulu or something. Maybe. But start a movie series with Leatherface again? I just don't think the demand is there. I really don't. I think you get a good first movie, but to turn this thing into a series, I just don't think people care. I just really don't. And generally speaking, Super Chat from David Lee Baron. Dear Senor Piche, have you seen Halloween 5? If so, what are your thoughts? I heard it was nominated for an Oscar. You should watch it. Just joking. Halloween 5 is the greatest fucking movie of all time. It's the greatest movie of all time. There is no other film that is better than Halloween 5. I am joking. I am absolutely joking. But somebody will take that and make a clip out of it. Because that's what people do. Ah, uh, ba-da-da-da. Dave McRae admits Halloween 5 is legit. Halloween 5 is dog shit. It's absolute dog shit. Uh, let's see here. Na -na -na -na. Yeah, the stream had a bit of a hiccup there earlier. Um, 
Justin Simonson says, Hey Dave, I'm a part of a YouTube channel where we stream talk horror interviews with commentaries uh, as the stream warriors. Would love to have you on the show at some point and talk. It's me, Billy. I get a lot of requests for things like that and I'm totally down doing that kind of thing but my schedule, as you can imagine, is very tight at the moment. I have other shows that I'm going on that that I'm backed up uh, and there's a lot going on with me right now. Um so I can't, I can't guarantee that. Um, but uh, keep it in my mind because uh, I do forget about these things. Ask me every so often. Um, and uh, and uh, maybe we'll see if we can make it work. I can never guarantee anything. It's just I get... And I'm not just saying that. There are a lot of people that reach out to me and ask, can you come on this? Can you come on that? Can you come on this? Can you come? Which is very flattering. And I'd be more than happy to. I don't care if you got, you know, 100 subs or 1,000 subs or 900,000 subs. I, I'd be more than happy to do it. But it's just schedule. It's just time, you know? And and um, so, but keep it out there, you know? And uh, and we'll see if we can make it work. Um, Valentino uh, Tarhan. Tarhan? 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 Yeah, it was brutal. In H18, only one stomp, and they cut from it very fast. Wasn't that violent. Uh, I am I hate the fact that they even did that. I hate the fact that they even had Sartain's head explode like a pile of meatloaf. Or, I, I didn't like that. That, that. That's not what, that's, again, It's. I understand it's great for today's audiences. It works, totally get it. But it's not something that I, I would have done. But it's like, well, Dave, you're just a fun. You, just, you gotta get with the times, Dave. You're too old school, man. You gotta get with the times, Dave. You gotta get with the times, Dave. Come on. But, Dave! <sighs> Robert Andrew Paul says, Travis, I highly disagree. Uh, Travis, oh, I always get this mixed up again. Lauterbaugh, Lauterbaugh, Lauterbaugh. i probably get it wrong. Really unpopular opinion. Texas Chainsaw 1974 holds up better than H18. Well, it depends on what you mean by holds up better. If you're talking about production value, I mean, we can quantify that, and that's actually not true. Uh, that's 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 not true. I mean, obviously, H18 has a better production value than the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's because it's a modern film shot with modern technology and modern cameras, right? Uh, so it really depends on what you mean by holds up better. And then we can look at it, and, and we can see if we agree or disagree. Uh, TMB sends in another super chat, but Dave, how was Dominic to know who the man in black was? He didn't. He was busy role-playing and pretending as Michael in his downtime. <laughs> it's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, what's his face there? Uh, Don Shanks did play the man in black on uh, a couple occasions in part five. Yeah. That was such a, like, that's like to, to like the sole reason why that was created was simply to add a subtext, a, a subplot of mystery that they had no idea who he was. By the end of the movie, they had no idea who he was. They didn't even have an idea of who he was. And I think Malik Akkad said something to the effect of, well, we had, maybe he said something like, well, we had a bunch of ideas, but we didn't know. Like, yeah, but anybody could have a bunch, like, real, they didn't know. They had no idea who he was. That's incompetence. It's incompetence. You don't write stories that way. You don't throw something in because the story, basically the reason why the director of H5 wrote The Man in Black in is because, his, because what he had written wasn't good enough. He needed more. They were rewriting as they were shooting. It was a terrible decision. I don't know. I, God, Deborah Hill. I, don't, I was all Deborah Hill. She was the one that vouched for him and got him on board. I just don't understand. You know, it was a terrible movie. Terrible. You know, it, it look, there are moments in it, like, that's a good shot. That's a nice moment. I like that scene. But the movie is dog shit. There's no suspense. There's no, it's just, I mean, oh, it's terrible. Especially coming out off of the, uh, you know, acceptable, decent Halloween 4. Recon Ma Recon Man 85 says, Dave, do you think Halloween Kills will be more violent than Rob Zombies? I do not. Well, uh, more, more violent than Rob Zombie's. Well, again, Rob Zombie's Halloween, the first one, was not gory per se, but it was, I mean, there was blood, there was blood, but it was very violent. It was intense. You see, that's what it's about, okay? Let me give you an example. Think of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. 
Okay. And the opening scene, of course, which was great with Octo Octavia Spencer, I think that's her name. Uh, she's the nurse in the hospital. Um, it's a dream, apparently. Um, not apparently, it is, but I'm just saying, on you know, it, it, it's too bad it was. Um, but when Michael Myers is killing the nurse, right? And you see him with that gigantic knife and he's going like this, like this, and, and you can see it. And the thunder and the lightning and the fire like this. That's fucking intense. But it's not overly gory. It's not like the kill itself is gory. Like you're seeing blood spurt everywhere and, and blood. Ah, like it's not really happening like that. But it's a very intense moment. It's cut and edited and mixed with the sound to, to be very intense for the viewer. I think we will see that in Halloween Kills. Maybe not every kill to that degree, but I think that's what you're going to see. At least, if again, if I, if I had to choose, I'm hoping it's that. Because I don't want to see blood guts and gore yes there will be blood of course there will be i'm not you know i'm not out to lunch here i mean i know there will be and i'm okay with that i understand the era we live in but i just don't want it to be gratuitous gore and blood and to the point where it's like it really does feel like friday the 13th you know and michael's coming by with like a saw you know and the head goes off and blood spurting i i don't want to see that but you can have intense violence with not a lot of gore. So I think it's 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 that balance. It's that balance for sure. Uh Recon Man 85 says, I separate violence from gore. To me, emotion makes something violent. Gore is just gore. So it's, it's a good way to look at it. Yep, it's a good way to look at it. Uh Josh McGrath says, Dave, if and when Jason and Freddie come back, how much would they make at the box office? I don't think they'll make as much as Halloween. Um it all depends on marketing. It depends on uh, what sort of nostalgia train is attached. Um, if you can convince Robert Englund to come back and Heather Langenkamp and you have, you know, it's a direct sequel to the original and, and you know, you shoot at the, the old house. And, I mean, you know, if you attach a nostalgic train to an Elm Street film, I don't know if it's going to make $250 million at the worldwide box office, but it will probably do very well. Uh, same thing with Friday the 13th. Um, it depends. Are you remaking A Nightmare on Elm Street? Are you remaking Friday the 13th? Or are you tapping into the nostalgia train and you're getting, you know, Adrian King back and you're getting, you know, Amy Steele back or, you know, you're getting, I mean, and then you're doing a direct sequel where they don't die, you know, or you're doing, you know, I mean, who knows? You know what I mean? Like, it depends on what sort of nostalgia train you've got attached to it, which was a big factor in the success of Halloween 2018 for sure. Um, but that's, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. That's a big thing. Um, Edwin Sordo says, if you buy the 24 by 36, it's me, Billy poster. Does it come with a poster frame? Does it also come with a Blu-ray? Uh, well, it should, no, it won't come with a poster frame. No, no, you, you, you'd have to buy that. Um, it would come rolled up in a poster tube, uh, is how you would receive it. Uh, does it come with a Blu-ray? Uh, does it, it should say, let me see here. The, you're talking about the, it's me, Billy poster. Uh, it all says it's me, Billy poster. Uh, it does not come to the special thanks. The digital download package is what comes with the It's Me Billy poster. So you get uh, the digital download package, which is great because you'll get the movie in full HD. You'll get a high resolution image of the poster and you'll get uh, a digital copy of the script. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And you also get your name in the special thanks section of the end credits as well as the poster, 24 by 36. But no, it'll be rolled up in a poster too. To frame every poster would just be, I mean, we'd have to charge you a lot more. So uh, yeah, it'd be a lot more than than uh, what it is because framing can be, I mean, and then they're shipping that as well, right? I mean, we, you know, it's easier to ship a rolled up poster than it would be to ship a poster framed, right? So you guys got to take care of that, but you will get the poster. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Valentino Tarhan says storyline promotion would play a big factor. hundred percent. Josephine, uh, Bert, uh, Josephine Bristow, Bristow, I think 
or is it Toe, Bristow, Bristow? It can be a couple of different ways. Uh, I think Freddie and Jason will do well and the box office at the box office because people have been waiting so long for a new version of them. I agree, but the 2010 version didn't do all that well. And Friday the 13th from 2009 did okay, but not that well. And you could say, well, they were just garbage movies and never Robert Englund. Uh, but see, it's not just about that. If you can get Robert Englund attached, Heather Lang, again, Halloween 2018 did well, not just because it's Halloween, okay? It's because of, there was a nostalgia train attached on it. And it was the first Halloween movie in nearly 30 years to be released actually in the month of October. Can you believe that? Do you know that? The last movie to have been released the last Halloween movie to have been released actually in the month of October, which seems like a foregone conclusion. It seems like just a, yeah, was 1989's Halloween 5. Halloween 6 was released in September. Halloween 7, uh, sorry, Halloween, yeah, 7, I guess. Halloween H2O was released in the summer, in July, I think. Halloween Resurrection was released in the summer. The both Rob Zombie films were released in the summer. Halloween 18 was the first Halloween movie in nearly 30 years to be released in the month of October near Halloween. It sounds crazy, but it's true. So that played a factor as well. Halloween movie at Halloween time called Halloween. I mean, geez, you know, and you have a whole new generation who that that's that's new and exciting for. So we cannot underestimate uh, those as well. OK, we'll go for uh, we'll take this thing to 1230. So that's about another seven minutes here. Uh, David Lee Barron sends in a super chat. Thank you, David, says I love your name. Piche sounds so sophisticated and cool. If you had a son, what would you name him? Hopefully not a name like Bob. <laughs> I have a brother, Bob, and an uncle, Bob. Robert, of course, is the full name for Bob. So um, Piche, yeah, for those of you that don't know uh, what David Lee Barron is talking about, my uh, yeah, I mean, my last name is McRae. That is my name. But um, my dad, who has since passed, he passed away almost 10 years ago. Um, his name was Earl McRae, of course. Uh, but his dad, my grandfather, was killed in World War II. And my grandfather's name, his dad, was Earl Piche. Um, so then my dad, my dad's mom, my grandmother, married a man later on named Bill McRae. And my dad never had his name legally changed. They just start, He just started going by Earl McRae. Uh, so that went, now it is, it's, he's got a, a birth certificate that says that and everything, but I don't think it was ever really legally changed. It's crazy. But anyway, so when I was, so when my dad got married and I was born, I'm Dave McRae, but technically I'm not related to anybody in my family. I mean, I, I'm half related obviously, but I, I don't have any McRae blood in me really. So, um, yeah. So I guess in, from a certain point of view, I'm not a McRae. I'm a Piche. Uh, but my dad took on the name McRae ever since he was three years old. So, uh, yeah, no, Piche is, uh, uh, was the name of my grandfather. Earl Piche uh, was his name. And he was, he was killed in World War II. He was killed by a sniper uh, as he was riding on a tank. And, and, and he was killed like weeks before the war ended. Isn't that crazy? But it's so crazy that maybe I wouldn't exist. You know, who knows? Crazy stuff indeed. Uh, if I had a son, what would I name him? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't have any children. I will not be having children. Uh, I don't have anything against children. I just have never been somebody that wanted to have kids. Just never wanted to have kids. I, I wanted to really be sort of focused on me and, and the things I want to do in my life and my career. And, and uh, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who have kids. So I play Uncle Dave a lot. I have a brother who has three kids. So, you know, um, you know, I, I am certainly not uh, void without any children, um, but uh, I just never wanted to have kids of my own. I, I just wanted to just, you know, focus on myself and my career and and uh, and whatnot. So, uh, and thankfully, I'm with a lovely lady who also doesn't want to have kids. So, um, so that is important too. That that was very important for both of us when we first got together. It was like, well, I don't want to have kids. Okay, good guy. Because because why would you stay together if one wants to have kids? It's just, I mean, it may not be a problem at that moment because you know you're basking in the euphoria of a new and exciting relationship. But eventually, the novelty is going to wear off, and that's going to be a problem so uh very important that you uh figure all that out from the very beginning but nothing against kids i love kids but it's just just not for me just not for me um so uh yeah funny stuff um diehard drummer 84 says with you 
with you there 110, 110%, Dave, nothing against kids. Oh, with you there 110%, Dave, nothing against kids, just uh, more time, money, and freedom to yourself. Yeah, it's funny. I always tell this joke. Um, I have a cat, of course, as you guys know, Veda. She's my little fur baby, right? And... Um, uh, Bruce, my buddy, Bruce, who of course has, has two kids and he has, uh, two stepdaughters, I guess. Um, and, uh, wonderful kids. Oh, his kids are just fantastic. And, uh, he had them very young. He had, uh, his two boys he had when he was 21, uh, and 23, I think. So they're, they're like 19 years old and 17 or almost that. So, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. They're getting so big, but anyway, so one time he was over at my place, I don't know, about three or four years ago. And Bruce feels the same way about pets. Uh, he just never really wanted pets. You know, he didn't want pets. Um, but he, he made this joke. And Bruce, if you're watching, I'm just busting your balls, man, because I think this is funny. Uh, he, uh, Veda was uh, being cute, you know, or something like that. And, and Bruce was like, oh, yeah, it's cute. It's cute. You know, and I'm like, yeah, you really don't want to have pets. Dude. And he's like, nah, he's like, you know, whenever I see pets, whether it's dogs or cats, I just see responsibility. And I looked at him and I said, I know what you mean. I think the exact same way when I see children, you know, and he's like, yeah, okay. Touche, touche. Cause obviously children are way more responsibility and way more important responsibility than pets. Not that pets are important. I mean, you know, we love our animals, right? But in the grand scheme of things, obviously children are way more responsibility and way more expensive. So I just thought it was kind of funny that he said that. And, and I was like, yeah, but you have got kids, you know, and they're, they're, they're that's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, so anyways, just busting his balls, but, but, uh, yeah, I just never wanted to have kids. Just never. I just was very passionate and focused on myself. And I knew like, listen, when you have kids, they become your life and rightly so like shout out to all the awesome moms and dads out there, you know, and shout out to the shitty moms and dads out there. Cause you fucking suck. But anyway, shout out to the great moms and dads out there. And, um, uh, cause I mean, it's the biggest, it's one of the biggest responsibilities in your life and your life changes. Like, I don't need to have children to know this. I mean, your life changes your, they become your world. The things that you thought you may want, you can't do, you know, or it's gotta be put on hold and rightly so you've got the number one responsibility, right? Um, and it, it can, and it can change you for the better too. It can make you a better person, more responsible. It can be a wonderful thing to have children. But I think it was responsible of me, you know, to, I never really wanted to have kids. I never did. I think I would make a good dad. I think I would make a good dad, but it doesn't mean I want to have kids. So I knew, I knew that, you know what, the best thing to do is just, I don't want to have kids and I don't want to put myself in a position where that may happen even accidentally. So I've been very, I've been very, I've been very responsible that way. And, uh, but shout out to the, all the awesome moms and, uh, and dads out there because, uh, Oh, Lord knows, man, we need more of you. We need more of you. Um, all right, so just a few more questions here because I went off on a tangent there. Let me go back here and see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, super chat from... Got that one. Super chat from Frank Riker for the sexy MFers in the chat. Frank going hard into the paint. I love it. Love when Fra Frank, you, you always know the show is coming to an end when Frank hits that super chat. I love it. Frank, you're awesome, man. Uh, amazing stuff. Oh, Frank missed. My, oh, he's probably talking about his own super chat. You missed my super chat, McCray. I got it. I got it. Uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, DMT Infinity says, Dave, have you seen any episodes of McCray's McMinute? Love it. Uh, what a smart and hilarious dude. Wish uh, he... Uh, he's talking about my dad. Well, of course. I remember when my dad was doing them. Wish you could have made more episodes. I love the skit on voices and the way people talk every day. Yeah. Yeah. My dad, uh, he didn't, he didn't really want to do those. He was he sort of did them because they were moving into a digital age now. Right. Because this is back in the mid to uh, late two thousands. So, um, yeah, my dad was old school because my dad, I mean, my dad comes from the golden age of journalism. I mean, my dad, I mean, my dad's met the Beatles. My dad's met Burton Cummings. My dad's met Robert Kennedy. Uh, I got, like I said, I have, I have, uh, 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 photos on my wall here of my dad and my mom right here on some cruise with Liberace, you know, and it's a photo of the three of them together and it's signed by Liberace. My dad had an amazing career, uh, but he was a journalist through the sixties and the seventies and the eighties and, you know, long before, you know, the digital age of, 
journalism and how it's really gone down the tubes. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. And, and, uh, when they started to move into the digital age, you know, my dad was always like, oh, I don't know, can't do these minutes, you know? And, uh, yeah, I think he enjoyed them. Cause my, I, like, I get my theatrics and my satire and my, you know, crazy voices. I get it from my father. I do. I get it from my father. I, I've never had a mentor in my life, but if I, had to choose somebody i think it would be my dad but he was he wasn't he, he he never mentored me like he never did that but in some sort of just way of him being my dad i learned a lot if you know what i mean so yeah funny stuff indeed uh all right folks listen that's gonna do it for me for episode 81 of mccray live i want to thank everybody oh wait super chat going hard into the paint Mother Mayhem says, sorry I missed most of this. Mom Duty's called. Always a pleasure and I'll rewatch later. Thank you so much, Mother Mayhem, for uh, that super chat and supporting the channel. And no worries at all. Mom Duty's Mother Mayhem, man. Shive, I think we are. Oh, that was strange. Okay, something something happened there and it said I was reconnecting to the stream, but I'm still on. Maybe it did that. That was very strange. Very strange. Okay, I'm good. I'm here. All right. No, I'm here. Okay. Anyway, I'll just say, yes, Mother Mayhem, uh, we're good now. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, I, that, that was weird. It kind of, there was a hiccup. That was very strange. Yes, uh, Mother Mayhem, of course, is a mom, and she's a mom to, uh, I think it's, you got two kids, right? Or maybe three, one guy. I, I know one's very young, so she's got mom duties coming out of her yin-yang, so definitely, I appreciate that. Anytime anybody can tune in when they got mom duties, like Tabitha Short, our great moderator here, Tabitha Short's got a very young baby. She, too, of course, tends to dip in and out because she's got mom duties, and these are super moms. These are super moms, I'm telling you. Uh, so <laughs> no worries there. No worries there. And thank you for the super chat. I really do appreciate that. Folks, I will be back. Uh, well, like I always say, there's always an opportunity. There could be a standalone video because um, you never know what's going to happen in the world of entertainment and movies. But uh, if not, I will definitely be back on uh, Thursday morning, 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time for episode 82 of McCray Live. So that'll do it for me. And don't forget, folks, the It's Me Billy campaign is live right now. The link is in the... In the description, please head over there. Anything you can contribute, anything you can donate, we really, really appreciate it. Let's get these numbers up before the It's Me Billy a thon this weekend. Uh, and make sure you tune into that. Myself and Bruce here in the studio, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be plugging that all week. So, uh, in the meantime and in between time, guys, soon. All righty. Cheers. <laughs>